Greetings once again, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of Pokemon Gold, Silver, and Crystal. We'll be starting off today with yet another trade evolution because this game just can't get enough of those. This evolution in particular is the Kingdra evolution. Using the Dragon Scale that we picked up in Mount Mortar, we can turn Seedra into Kingdra. And it just so happens that when I went to capture a horsey to do this evolution, it so happened to be carrying yet another Dragon Scale, so I've got another one to spare. So what exactly do I do with this thing? It's only good for evolving Seedra. I don't need another one. You know, if my luck were good in all the right places, I would have found one of the other rare drop trade evolution items, but... <laughs> I guess beggars can't be choosers. This will also be the episode where I finally accomplish one of my other goals. See, off screen I have been doing a lot of grinding on gold version in order to fill out Pokedex slots, and the reason I was doing that is because you cannot mass import Pokemon from other games unless you have at least 150 Pokemon registered in the Pokedex. I think I mentioned this before, but I have kind of a mini rant as to how annoying that is. Seriously, 150? Keep in mind that in the previous generation, there were zero requirements for mass transferring Pokémon like this. It really just feels like an unnecessary inconvenience, and to be honest, I could have just traded all of the Pokémon from Gen 1 anyways, they don't stop you from doing that, but uh, that would take even longer and require me to get a bunch of trade fodder, and I just wasn't interested in doing all of that for the sake of transferring my collection from the previous generation. So. Here we go, I've transferred my collection, and I know it says 190 there, but I actually missed a couple Pokémon from my yellow file, so once those are transferred in, I will actually only have about 45 more to go, so that's pretty nice. Getting back to our adventure, as soon as you boot the game back up after becoming champion, you can head to the Professor's Lab to pick up an item that will allow you access to the Kanto region. It is a ticket for the SS Aqua, which is a ship that goes from Olivine City to Vermilion City, which is actually kind of weird if you think about it. I mean, why do we need a cruise ship to go to Kanto? I mean, we could just go to the Pokémon League and head east, but the path is still blocked, so I don't get it. Not to mention Vermilion City seems oddly landlocked. The body of water connected to it doesn't have any paths to the open sea, unless Cycling Road is actually supposed to be a bridge, and they just couldn't convey that with Game Boy graphics. You know what, we're not even headed to Kanto yet anyways, there's actually some stuff to wrap up in Johto, so let's get to that first. First and foremost, there's a couple items that you can only get on specific days of the week that I haven't gotten yet. So on Sundays only, fly to Akrotik City and then head south towards that group of three apricot trees, and you will find Sunny of Sunday. What a clever name, so very creative. Anyways, the item he gives is a magnet which will power up electric type attacks. I have no idea how a simple magnet does that. But I'm sure it makes sense in the Pokémon universe, maybe if, like, Magnemite or Pikachu uses it. One of those guys, maybe? I don't know. Also on Sunday, you can head to the Goldenrod Department Store to pick up a TM based on the friendship level of one of your Pokémon. If your friendship level with that Pokémon is very high, you will get the TM for Return, which will do more damage based on the friendship level of your Pokémon, and if you have very low friendship with your Pokémon, you will instead get the TM for Frustration, which does the exact opposite. It does more damage based on how much your Pokémon hates you which will gradually be less and less the more you use your Pokémon anyways, so it's not really a good move. Return is pretty useful, especially in competitive play though, and you can even get this TM more than once. You can only get it once per week, but you can get it multiple times. Really convenient. Now, this one makes no sense. You remember that hedge maze over by the Lake of Rage? Well, if you go there on a Wednesday, this NPC will appear and give you a Black Belt, which is an item that powers up Fighting-type moves. The fact that he is in such an out-of-the-way area makes me wonder if anyone actually found him, and for some reason there was also a trainer here that I don't remember being there. Maybe he shows up after you beat Team Rocket? Let it not be said, this game isn't full of very weird things. And finally, if you go west out of Violet City on a Thursday, you will find Arthur of Thursday. That's probably the most clever pun name they've come up with out of all seven of the so-called weak siblings. Arthur will give you a hard stone, which I'm pretty sure he just pulled his sword out of, and oh my goodness, swords and hard stones. Please, no, not again! And now we have something that's probably going to need, like, an entire essay to explain. So, over in Japan, I've talked about how they had that mobile service over in Japan that let you trade and battle through the mobile system. Well, it also let you download an item that would let you access Gen 2's version of Mew. A Pokémon so rare and obscure that it's not even counted by the game as far as dex completion goes. You can get the diploma without this Pokémon as it happens. 
Even though the event was translated in the English version of Crystal, the event itself was never unlocked internationally. You could only unlock the event in Japan. Internationally, they just distributed the Pokémon directly, which is kind of a shame. Of course, years down the line, they eventually released Crystal on the 3DS Virtual Console, where they just enabled the event for everybody as soon as you beat the Elite Four. You can go into the Goldenrod City Pokémon Center and get the infamous GS Ball, which is the item that triggers the event. You would then hand it off to Kurt, come back the next day, and then the event you are seeing right now starts up. Now, in my case, I'm emulating this, so I was hoping that I could use a patch to enable this event, and I did find a patch that supposedly enables this event as soon as you beat the champion, but when I got that far, it wasn't working. I couldn't get the event to start. So instead, I just used a GameShark code to enable the event instead, and the code that I used will be posted in the video description so you can get this event too, if you aren't playing on the 3DS or whatever. So the GS Ball is actually a funny item to talk about because in the show, the characters obtain the GS Ball and start carrying it around, and then they hand it off to Professor Oak, and then the ball is never mentioned again. For the entirety of the show's run, the GS Ball was dropped completely, and they just decided to put the relevant Pokémon that it was originally going to be related to in the fourth Pokémon movie. So, kind of a bit hilarious if you ask me, especially since it clearly indicates that movies and merchandising supersede any sort of forward planning the writers had. The Pokémon in question is the Grass Psychic Pokémon Celebi, a time traveler who may or may not have been responsible for the creation of the Pokédex, as far as the movies are concerned anyways. It may be only level 30, but remember that you only get one shot at this thing, so do be sure to save before triggering the event. And also be sure to stock up on Ultra Balls, I actually ran out in this battle because I had not stocked up after beating the champion. I had to resort to Pokéballs again, that seems to be a habit of mine. Anyways, Celebi doesn't have much in the way of battle, it's got Safeguard and I think it's got one or two good attacks, and it also has a move we haven't seen yet called Heal Bell, I think that cures all status effects of your entire party, so being on a wild Pokémon isn't too useful for them, at least. I can't remember if Celebi is particularly powerful, but it is nice to have a Heal Bell user, so I guess I could put it in my party at some point. Then again, I have been avoiding Legendary, so maybe not. I don't know. Something that I think is incredibly annoying about events like this is that they always make it so that you have to unlock the event by connecting to the internet or something. Like, you have to get the item from a distribution of some kind. And I really think events like this should just unlock after a certain point in the story, because... Anybody with a copy of Crystal version, no matter where you are in the world, unless you're playing on the 3DS Virtual Console, you're just not going to be able to get Celebi through this event. You have to use a glitch or a Game Shark or something. It's not a good practice in my opinion, but they still do it to this day, which is unfortunate. At any rate, it's time to finally board the SS Aqua and head for the Kanto region, and to be perfectly honest, you know, as much as I like to stay positive, something that people rightfully point out about the Kanto region is that it's not as interesting as the Johto region. There's not a lot going on in it, and may have been an afterthought considering that they did all of that work on Johto, noticed that they had the cartridge space to include Kanto, and thought that it would be a really great idea to put in a bunch of extra space for the player to run around in, which is really nice. This is the only generation that lets you do two regions in one game. And of course the remakes also include Kanto, you know what I'm saying. However, if we compare the SS Aqua to the SSN for example, this ship is not as big as the SSN and there's not a lot of stuff happening on it. There's one event that we need to worry about and one item of interest to get. Other than that, there are some filler trainers that I'm actually going to fight because I need to get some EXP on the Pokémon that have been sitting unevolved in my box all this time. I have to fill out that Pokédex somehow and this is going to be how I do it. I'm about to battle one of the trainers, and I'm actually going to show this battle because I want to demonstrate a modification that I made to the ROMs. This is a very easy modification to make, and I decided to demonstrate it because you may have noticed up to this point that the life meters in Gen 2, they decrease really, really slowly. Uh, someone did a comparison of the first five generations and how slowly the life bars decrease. It turns out that the fastest life bars are in Generation 1, followed by 3, then 5, and then Gen 2 and 4 have the slowest health bars in the entire first five generations, which is really interesting to think about. Now, someone did some data mining and researched the game code and found that there is some kind of bug in Generation 2 onwards, as a matter of fact, that causes the life meter to decrease much, much slower than it should, which creates the problem of the infamous 
Gen 4 health bars. If you knock out something with 1000 HP in a single hit, it takes like 30 seconds for the entire health meter to drain, which is really awful. And according to this data miner, it is the result of a very easily fixed bug, and even demonstrated how to do it, so that's what I did. I fixed the bug in all of my ROMs, and to be honest, some players have expressed that this might not actually be a bug, or at the very least they left it in when they noticed that the health meters draining that slowly actually adds to the tension, especially in major battles, because you don't know if you got a critical hit until you see the life meter drain further than it normally would, right? So maybe, just maybe, they wanted to up the tension a little bit by having the health meters drain slower. But it also means that the health meters drain slower and battles take a lot longer. If you pay attention in this video, you will notice that, because of the modification I made, the life meters are now draining as fast as they would in Gen 1, which is appropriate considering we are headed for the Kanto region. So for the moment, I am planning on keeping the health meters modified, as you see in this video. Uh, if you would like me to revert the change, because I can still do that, if you would like me to revert the change before the finale to this playthrough, I will do so. Let me know in the comments. At any rate, the events on the ship are very easy to understand. We need to find a missing girl, and she just so happens to be in the only area blocked off by another sailor. That sailor wants us to go find his lazy friend, and we find him in one of the cabins, we battle him, we beat him, and then we're allowed to pass, for some reason. You'd think a missing girl would take priority over a lazy co-worker, but this is the Pokémon universe. This was also the battle where the Mareep I was leveling up in the background reached level 15 and evolved into Flaffy. That was much sooner than I expected, but of course when you've got an EXP share, it's very easy to just go about your business and let the Pokémon holding it level up while you are doing whatever. And since we're talking about leveling, I just want to mention that the EXP share makes leveling a lot easier than it was in Gen 1, but uh, it's still rather painful if you want to level up a lot of Pokémon at once for the purpose of filling out your Pokédex. It's still a really awful affair, and I haven't even gotten to the breeding that you have to do or the friendship evolutions. Those are going to take some time, too. It's unfortunate, but them's the breaks, I guess. If you want to complete a Pokédex, then you're going to be spending a lot of time on stuff like this. So now we can get past this sailor and finally make progress towards finding the girl, but first I decide to battle somebody. You see, there's this trainer here, he seems to be seasick, he's standing in front of the trash can, but there's nothing in the trash can for some reason. And despite being seasick, he will actually battle you if you ask him to, which reveals that his name is Fritz. Uh, there's nothing really interesting about this guy, I just wanted to make a stupid joke involving his name. See, his stomach appears to be on the Fritz, because he's seasick. Oh, don't you groan at me, you know this is just another day in the life of Efring225, making bad puns port and starboard. That's, uh, nautical lingo, cause we're on a ship, you might not know it. <laughs> Getting back to the action, however, you might have noticed that the enemy levels are a bit lower than you're probably expecting. I mean, we just got done with a champion battle, and he was at around level 50, and the Elite Four were at around level 40-45, which is where the player is probably going to be when they get done with that whole thing. So to see the enemy using level 30 Pokémon is a bit strange. To be honest, I didn't think the level curve was that much of an issue throughout Johto except for Mahogany Town, and that's because I went there after doing two other gyms. Like I mentioned, you're allowed to go to Mahogany Town immediately after Ecruteek, so the levels have to be adjusted to account for that possibility, and there's no scaling. Here, however, the player can definitely be expected to be above level 40, so what's the deal with all these level 30 Pokémon? Well, the only reason I can imagine that they are so low, other than the level curve being strange, is that the player is considered the champion of the Johto region by this point. Why would any of the other trainers be able to match them at this point? In other words, I'm thinking the developers simply thought that cannon fodder trainers like this should not be able to match a regional champion, and that's why the levels are unusually low, but then again, if these trainers are meant to provide EXP fodder, then it's not a lot of EXP. Well, it is a decent sized amount of EXP, but not as much as it probably could have been. I think the player can be expected to defeat level 40s with ease by this point. At any rate, I'm just rambling to fill dead air. It turns out that the missing girl was in the captain's cabin this entire time, which, uh... You'd think that the captain would notify everybody that there's a missing girl constantly bugging him. He doesn't even say anything here, it's really weird. At any rate, we return the girl and we get, as a reward, a Metal Coat, which is an item that not only powers up Steel-type moves, it is also yet another trade evolution item. How nice. 
They waited until the post game to give the metal coat, which gives access to some of the brand new steel types. I mean, you could have gotten the metal coat earlier if you farmed magnemites for it because they randomly drop it. And I say drop, but they're actually randomly felled with it as a hold item. So not only is finding it before this point really hard to do, it's also yet another trade evolution item. They have just way too many of those if you ask me. Anyways, the ship has docked in Vermilion City and annoyingly, I actually missed a hidden item that you can only find immediately after the ship docks. If you leave the harbor area, then you can't go back in without getting on the ship, sailing it to Olivine City, and then getting back on the ship again and sailing it back to Vermilion City, and I'm pretty sure the ship only sails on certain days, so that's going to be annoying. And you know, the hidden item is an iron, so it really doesn't matter, it's just an iron, you can buy those infinitely, but still, that's one really hidden, hidden item. But hey, enough about ranting about hidden items, I should be gushing about the nostalgia in this city because we are in Vermilion City with the classic Gen 1 music, or remix of it rather, and you saw that there was a Snorlax in front of Diglett's cave. We don't have a Poke Flute, so we're going to have to find some other way to wake him up. Hey, wait a minute, if that's the same Snorlax from Generation 1, then he must have gone through a lot of effort to climb over the guardhouse and through all of that grass to get to Diglett's cave and then situate himself in front of it. And seriously, why do they not try to capture the sleeping Pokémon while it's asleep? Why do you need to wake it up first? Oh well. There's not a lot going on in this city, but you can revisit the Pokémon fan club and listen to the chairman gush about his Rapid Ash for a very long time yet again. He doesn't give you a bike voucher this time though, he just gives you a rare candy, and that's nice to have. I'm gonna need that later for all the leveling I have to do. The funny thing is though, in Silver version, immediately after the chairman was done and gave me the rare candy, I got a call from a random trainer and she started gushing about her Rapidash. What is with Rapidash? Everyone loves Rapidash these days. The chairman, Chris, this girl I'm getting a call from, crazy. Also pretty funny is the guy with a Clefairy doll. He goes on and on about how cute it is when Clefairy metronomes, but it's actually just a doll that he's got next to him. I mean, he couldn't well bring an actual Clefairy and have it metronome, right? It might accidentally explode and blow up the building. At any rate, there's a cut tree in front of the Vermilion City Gym, as usual, but you don't need to get your cut user, you can just surf around it, and in this case, I happen to get an encounter in the Vermilion City waters. It's just an encounter with a tentacruel, but I want you to open your ears and pay attention to the music. It's the classic Gen 1 Wild Encounter theme, and that's awesome. They actually went the extra mile to add all of the Gen 1 music to the Kanto region. Or rather, they remixed it so it sounds even better now. And as we enter the Vermilion City Gym, I'm actually going to fight one of the trainers because the original Gen 1 trainer battle theme has also been remixed for the Kanto region. Look, I'm totally aware that there are a lot of pros and cons to the inclusion of the Kanto region in Gen 2, but I really think they went the extra mile when they decided to include it because all of the locations look pretty much the same as they did before. One of the big pros to the Kanto region is that there are going to be a lot of changes to it, considering that there has been a three-year gap since Gen 1, canonically speaking. So there's going to be a lot of places that have changed over the years, and it's nice to see that. And the remixed music is an excellent addition. They didn't need to do it, but they did anyways, and that's pretty cool. And of course you get to battle all of the Kanto Gym Leaders all over again. Well, most of them. Some Gym Leaders have actually changed, because of course Giovanni is more or less out of the picture, and Koga is now an Elite Four member, so somebody's gotta replace him, right? We'll see who that is in time, but for now, I would like to announce that Gen 2 has removed the trash can puzzle from Lieutenant Surge's Gym, and I absolutely love this change. The trash can puzzle is one of the worst moments of Generation 1, and is one of the only reasons I hesitate to replay it again when I feel like playing a Pokémon game. <sighs> so, of course, it returns in Fire Red and Leaf Green, and the remakes of Gen 2, Heart Gold and Soul Silver. Yes, they did in fact remake the trash can puzzle in Heart Gold and Soul Silver, games that are remakes of a game that did not originally feature the trash can puzzle, but it was in Fire Red and Leaf Green, so they had to make it return, I guess. I suppose not even Heart Gold and Soul Silver can be the perfect video game, right? Well, it looks like Lieutenant Surge is ready for a battle, and I should say right out of the gate that he and the other Kanto Gym Leaders are obviously not going to be as weak as they were in Gen 1. They're actually going to use their strongest Pokémon and they'll be at full power. Very appropriate for the Johto Regional Champion that they're going to be facing. Now, I'd like to point out two things in particular. 
One, this remix of the Gen 1 Gym Leader theme is absolutely amazing and you should definitely listen to it outside of this video, because my voice is going to ruin it for everybody. Two, did anyone notice how chunky Raichu is in this game? Look at how big that belly is! What has he been eating lately? Pancakes? Probably. Now, as much as I'd like to tell you that the Kanto Gym Leaders are going to all be interesting challenges that I'm going to have to work to overcome, uh, it's not really going to turn out that way for the most part because the Kanto Gym Leaders all still use one single type of Pokémon, and in Lieutenant Surge's case it's really easy to just throw in a ground type and shut them all down that way because their strongest attacks aren't going to be able to hit you if you've got a ground type. And he's even got a Magneton in his team which will be double weak to ground. Uh, some of his Pokémon have double team which might make it a little hard to hit them, but it's really not that much. I mean, it's worth stating yet again that the player by this point is the Johto Regional Champion. Throwing a bunch of teams at them consisting of only one type of Pokémon when they've by this point probably raised a very diverse team of Pokémon that can handle anything is not going to make for a very interesting challenge. I guess I could mention one thing that I actually didn't know before this battle, however. It turns out that Machamp had a move called Vital Throw that I really should have been using. It's a move that always hits like Swift, and it's actually pretty powerful, and it's fighting type, so it's really good against Magneton. However, it has negative priority, meaning you always go second when you select it, so I had never selected it up until this battle. Just thought it was worth a note. You remember how I was talking about how gym leaders are designed, how they basically act as walls that the player has to figure out a specific strategy to overcome them? Well, the reason it works out that way is because the Johto gym leaders have types that actually complement this approach. You're not going to get past Whitney all that easily because there's only one type that is actually super effective against her type, and you're not going to get past Jasmine all that easily because your chosen Pokémon's defenses probably aren't that high and therefore can't withstand Steelix's attacks all that easily. They may be using teams that consist of only a single type of Pokémon, and therefore it looks like you're going to have an easy ride because you can just do the whole rock-paper-scissors thing and you'll come out on top, right? Well, it's not that simple because the game developers are going to be aware of the kind of Pokémon that you could potentially have by this point. This type of thinking doesn't really work anymore, however, because in the Kanto region, by this point, the player is going to have a wider variety of Pokémon available, they've probably raised a diverse team that can handle any situation. You might even be thinking like a PvP player. So yes, as far as Lieutenant Surge is concerned, you can just sweep him with a ground type or use your strongest Pokémon and you'll probably be okay. It's unfortunate that it turns out this way, but I also just think that Kanto's gym types really don't have much that they can do in terms of setting up a wall for you to overcome. I mean, Electric, that just gets shut down by ground. Rock type? I really don't want to think about how embarrassing that gym battle is going to be. At the end of the day, I think one of the things we have to accept is that Kanto is basically a victory lap. I mean, you're the Johto regional champ at this point, of course you're going to be running over all of the inferior trainers in this entire region, which maybe begs the question of why the player goes on this journey through the Kanto region if not simply to seek a brand new challenge and then finding a bunch of weaklings, ultimately leading up to the final boss of the region, who is one of the most epic battles in Pokémon history. And I don't want to spoil it, I mean there's approximately 5 people in my comments who haven't played this game all the way through to the end, but just in case you haven't played this through to the end, I'm not going to say who the final boss is, because it's actually a shocking revelation on par with finding the rival at the end of Gen 1, or finding out that Giovanni was the final gym leader. It's that epic. And considering that Gen 2 was originally intended to be the final Pokémon game before they realized that they could make it go on for much longer, that is one of the biggest bangs you could end the series on. At any rate, Lieutenant Surge is defeated and he actually doesn't hand over a TM, which I think is unfortunate. A TM for like Thunderbolt or something would have actually been very much appreciated. That's a decent move to get at this point. But okay, you don't want to hand over a TM, I'm fine with that, we can move on. This has actually been a pretty short episode because I didn't really know how far into Kanto I wanted to go in the first Kanto episode, considering that there was a couple of other things that I wanted to get out of the way, like the weak siblings and such. But I suppose if the other gym leaders are not as interesting as I think they're going to be, then I could uh, quicken the pace a little bit. I do have that patch that makes the life meters drain quicker, and that also makes the battles quicker, so... 
if I need to, I'll get through these a little bit faster. And there are still some Pokémon left to capture, so I'll be sure to show those off as well. At any rate, to cap off this episode, I'm going to show the trade evolutions that we now have access to thanks to the Metal Coat. There are two Pokémon that evolve by trading with the Metal Coat, so I guess between you and a friend you can get both of them in your Pokédex at least. One of these Pokémon is Caesar, which evolves from Scyther, and I definitely have plenty of those thanks to repeated bug-catching contests, so that's very easy to get. And the other Pokémon you can get with a Metal Coat is Steelix, which you evolve from Onix. So the Onix that Silver has been training throughout the entire game is now going to become a Steelix, and he finally has an actual Steel type, so that's going to be really nice to use. I'm hoping that it learns an actual Steel type move, and I don't have to waste the Iron Tail TN that I got from Jasmine, but I guess if I have to get a Steel type move at some point, then that'll be the one I get. So that's going to conclude this episode of Pokemon Gold, Silver, and Crystal, and we still have seven more Kanto badges to go, and then the final dungeon of the game. So. So, uh, I'm gonna try to make it as interesting to watch as possible, so I'll see you for the next episode, and I hope it goes well. Later, everybody!